All right, if you'll permit me, I think we'll we'll get started. Um, welcome, I'm Rebecca Joven. I'm the chief of the Vienna office for the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs for UNODA. And I'd like to warmly welcome uh, all of you, those of you in the room in person and on online as well to this special event as part of our Vienna conversation series. And um, just by means of background, we actually started this conversation series back in 2016 as an idea to have a forum, a platform for informal discussion, for knowledge sharing, um, for engagement with diverse audiences on current issues that are relevant to disarmament, uh, non-proliferation and arms control. And this is our first time back after the, or since the pandemic. So really excited um, about that and, and great that we can do it in this, in this hybrid format with many of you here uh, in person, as well as a, a very large online audience. So welcoming all of you. Um, I'm particularly delighted that we are hosting this event together with our great partners from the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation, the VCDNP. And um, we've been partners for a long time, over 10 years now, uh, since we were both founded uh, around the same time through an initiative of the, the Austrian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so um, it's been a joy and pleasure uh, to continue that partnership uh, with many joint events and projects, I'm sure. This will be uh, just the kickoff of many more to come. So um, I'm really excited about the lineup that we have for today's uh, relaunch of the Vienna Conversation Series. And I'm very honored to introduce my boss, uh, Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu, as our event speaker. Um, and uh, you may know Ms. Uh, Izumi Nakamitsu um, has been uh, in the position of Undersecretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs at the United Nations since um, May of 2017. And prior to that, she was Assistant Administrator in the Crisis Response uh, Unit of the uh, UN Development Program. And she has held many positions within the UN system. Um, she is also a proud uh, international gender champion. And with her, we're very lucky to have Ms. Elena Sokova, who will be our event moderator today. And Ms. Sokova is the executive director of VCDNP. And previously, she, sh uh, she served as deputy director of the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies at Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey. And she is well known to many of you, or I think all of you, um, as a, a well known expert in uh, nuclear disarmament, nonproliferation, in education uh, for disarmament and training. And she too is a proud international gender champion. So we're really excited to have both of them here today. And I know we'll uh, have an engaging discussion. I look forward to it. And so, uh, Elena, if I may, I'll, I'll just turn the floor to you to get us started. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Rebecca, very much for the introduction and for uh, actually being a par partnering with the VCDNP on organizing an event. But before we start, I really want to extend a warm welcome from all of you to High Representative Izumi Nakamitsu. Um, it's such a delight to have you back in Vienna. Uh, it is uh, always a special occasion, a special treat to have a conversation with you uh, and have a public discussion uh, involving both representatives from the national governments, those working at the international organizations here in Vienna, um, civil society representative, academia, and others. And I know we have a very large number of uh, listeners also joining us online. So thank you first and foremost for agreeing to do that. Um, before we jump into um, uh, uh, the discussion and the event today, I wanted to give you a few um, ideas about the format. The way we're going to handle it, uh, I will give the floor to um, High Representative uh, Nakamitsu for uh, her prepared remarks first, and then we will open the floor to questions from you in the audience here and those who are listening and watching online. We have somebody who will be monitoring the questions coming uh, from online participants as well. I may also use my privilege of a moderator and ask some questions as well. With that, without further ado, uh, it's really 
a, a big delight to have you here, Izumi, with us today. Please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena. It's so wonderful to be back. Um, I used to visit Vienna quite often before the pandemic, and um, and this is the first time since the pandemic. So um, I need to come back here, and I will be back very soon. Um, I will spend a couple of more days um, in June when I come back. Um, this time, uh, it's the chief executive board meeting uh, of the United Nations system that brought me here. Um, thank you for the occasion. Thank you for the partnership. Um, and then, uh, obviously, is a, a very close friend, uh, and um, and I understand, of course, a very strong support to to our office, uh, new head uh, of this office, uh, um, Rebecca. Um, I don't really have a prepared statement, but I would just say a few words uh, that this is a conversation series. So I've been looking forward to engaging with uh, with all of you uh, in active conversations. So um, 24th of February, obviously the Russian Federation invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, has put further stress on arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation. Um, I think in terms of, I mean, this has been said many times by the Secretary General, uh, because of the scale and nature of this war, um, this is um, uh, something that amounts to uh, a really serious challenge to international order and obviously um, international security architecture, especially European security architecture, is the, if you will, the first victim uh, of this uh, 24th of February invasion. Um, I think we need to make sure that while in the sort of uh, environment that we live in at the moment, um, it might be really too idealistic to, to even talk about disarmament, we have to first and foremost remember that arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation are not some sort of a utopian ideals, but those are in fact international security tools. It's a, it's a part and parcel of our security um, processes and architecture and the regime. Um, so let us not forget that uh, and let us also remember the history um, you know, I, the, the one that I of, often use is the, um, you know, a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a partial test ban treaty. Um, and then a few years later, of course, the MPT. So after a major security crisis, there will always be an opportunity to rethink the utility, usefulness of disarmament, uh, arms control um, and, and non-proliferation. Um, so whilst we are in this very difficult environment, we already, I feel that we already start to think about how do we make sure that um, in the post um, uh, Ukraine, um, when we are all start to really think about a new security architecture, how to use uh, this approach uh, as an integral part of um, our efforts. Um, so calculating from, from that moment, we actually do have very important moments uh, that is uh, that will be coming up. Of course, in June, there's a first um, meeting of states parties of a TPNW. Uh, and then in August, of course, after I think four times um, uh, postponement, finally, the, the 10th review conference of the MPT is taking place uh, in New York. Um, those, I think we need to make sure uh, will be important milestone events to make sure, first and foremost, protect what we have already uh, and um, use it as a, um, a first step towards further efforts to make sure that we have a safer and more secure world. Um, I am not entirely pessimistic. Um, I will give you um, a, a very concrete examples, um, you know, uh, as we speak in Geneva, there is the first substantive session of the Open Edit Working Group on outer space, uh, responsible co um, behavior in outer space uh, discussions taking place. Um, the discussions so far seem to be uh, quite substantive and, and um, very professional. Of course, um, everything that we do at the United Nations or any other multilateral platforms will be impacted by the current events. 
Uh, but if we actually put our minds together, we can use those uh, multinational platforms as an opportunity. Uh, let us also forget, uh, not forget, that many of the stresses that we see uh, on disarmament and arms control actually existed before Ukrainian war. Um, just to to put um, you know a couple of um, um, examples. Um, you know, rising tensions between nuclear armed states, of course, uh, millions and, and trillions uh, being spent on modernization of weapons um, and um, quite dangerous rhetorics about uh, utility usefulness of um, um, nuclear weapons taking place. Um, I think uh, something that we really need to get our heads around and, and uh, address is the um, intersections with um, you know rapidly developing uh, technologies and uh, you know emergence of new domains of potential conflict i'm talking about cyber and outer space of course uh, so they are already uh, quite important um, i would say a paradigm shift taking place that have that had been already impacting uh, the regime or the, the structures on arm, of arms control and, and disarmament that existed before the Ukrainian war started. Um, and now, of course, the, the diplomatic relations have been really worsened since the, uh, since 24th of February, uh, but we need to somehow reverse the, the, the trend and counter, for example, um, what I would call as a, a false narrative uh, that if Ukraine did not give up nuclear weapons, they would not have been uh, invaded, um, as if uh, nuclear weapons, uh, in fact, provide ultimate security. I think that would, that could create a um, stronger driver for proliferation. Uh, we need to make sure that those inaccurate narratives will be countered. Um, I'm sure there will be questions uh, about um, uh, what might be priorities for the MPT review conference, but just very briefly uh, from our perspectives, uh, one of the top priorities will be to protect and reaffirm the non-use principle. Um, the nuclear weapons should not be used, and this uh, non-use principle that have been actually kept since Nagasaki uh, absolutely need to be protected. Uh, and I think uh, MPT review conference will be a very important opportunity to re reaffirm that. Um, I don't even need to say the risk reduction um, in, in, in light of the, the really risky situations uh, unfolding in front of us. I think we need to make sure that it will be, a review conference will be utilized as a, um, an important platform to, to come up with a very practical, pragmatic risk reduction measures. Uh, and I would also like to add that the MPT itself as a cornerstone of non-proliferation, I would also say that international security uh, needs to be protected. Um, really strong reaffirmation, recommitment uh, of all states parties to the MPT uh, in August will be really critical. Um, we don't want to start having MPT um, eroding. Uh, many of um, disarmament uh, arms control agreements um, have been eroding before Ukraine. Uh, we now have to absolutely protect that MPT will stand relevant uh, and healthy uh, so that um, you know those new challenges that I've just uh, um, um, summarized will also be uh, looked at uh, in light of um, nuclear threats and, and dangers as well. Um, these are some of the, the priority um, that we would like to um, um, achieve at the August uh, review conference. And in order for us to achieve those objectives, um, you know, constructive, flexible, and professional and substantive dialogues will be critical. Um, we, I believe we can still do it, uh, judging from some of the difficult and yet substantive processes that we see. Um, in uh, disarmament area. So all efforts really need to be invested towards that. I will stop here now. And then, as I said in the beginning, uh, I'm looking forward to engaging with um, many of you 
um, sort of digging into some of those uh, issues. Back to you, Nana. Thank you very much, Izumi. I uh, wanted to, uh, the one, I, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And if I give you the floor, please introduce yourself before asking a question or commenting. And I would appreciate if you keep your uh, questions or interventions short. But in the meantime, um, uh, while uh, I'm looking for, for your hands, maybe somebody can help me also to take note of who is um, asking a question, is uh, one question that I would like to pose you, and you've already started alluding to it in your remarks. Obviously, many things have changed since February 24. Uh, with the invasion of Ukraine. And um, there is still hope from what I've heard from your remarks for uh, and a room for arms control. And you also correctly noted that the erosion of it started before that. And the question I have to you is, um, how do you see prospects for, for arms control? and what needs to happen for it to restart. Um, quite often I hear a phrase that we need trust before we have arms control uh, dialogue and negotiations, uh, whether it's a correct assumption and, and how we move down that path. Should I? Sure. Yeah. Wait, 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 no, I thank you for that very important question. Um, I mean, you know, obviously, I don't or we don't, no one has illusions that uh, conversations that will take place uh, now, from now on, you know, all the way to August and beyond um, would obviously be very, very difficult and nothing is going to be easy. Um, we, we, we all know that. Um, and I think you put a very important concept that is trust and confidence building. Um, I mean, my first instinct is that let's try to protect what we have. That's why MPT, you know, regime itself is quite important. Let us stop further erosion of what we have. Um, but beyond that, I think we have to start thinking about uh, what are the measures um, that states actually have engaged uh, for many, many years. And some of them, many of them actually took place in Vienna uh, in terms of confidence building. I'm talking about the, the, the previous, during the previous Cold War, uh, the Helsinki process, et cetera. There have been a long history of, you know, really serious efforts to build confidence that led to obviously uh, important progress in arms control and disarmament. And probably we will have to do something similar, but in a very different ways, because the, the challenges are very different. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, those new technologies and new domains of potential conflict, um, you know, combined potentially with nuclear risks, um, you know, all these things will require really uh, fresh thinking, as the Secretary General had been already saying, I think since 2018. Uh, there is a need for a new vision uh, in disarmament. And I think we have to start really thinking about what is the what it is that we need to uh, rebuild uh, and then what it is that we need to have a new visions for. Uh, and some of them will be, many of them initially, will be related to uh, confidence building measures and transparency measures. I think we can learn from, from the history and it's, uh, that's why you know, Vienna is also very relevant. Uh, many of the young people would not know, but I, I, I do remember those days uh, during the, the previous uh, Cold War. Um, so I think we need to make uh, really systematic efforts to build trust and confidence and, um, and we need to to think about those um, in new domains like cyber and uh, outer space uh, that would also be uh, linked to uh, nuclear risks uh, today. Um, you know, there are many um, or there are several uh, areas which I have been calling a sort of a black hole in, in, in disarmament arms control efforts, for example, the missiles. Um, all these uh, new er areas that we have not been tackling will also need to be uh, addressed in conjunction with 
uh, nuclear disarmament efforts. Um, so we have at the UN, of course, I fully also understand that disarmament efforts uh, do not only take place uh, in multilateral settings. They are important bilateral uh, you know, arrangements, uh, potentially also trilateral uh, discussions that needs to start. But I do believe that multilateral discussions are still quite relevant uh, and um, we need to make sure that uh, uh, some of the future opportunities, for example, uh, the Secretary General's new agenda for peace, uh, which he will be uh, publishing uh, sometime next year, um, of which disarmament is one of the pillars. Uh, so there will be uh, some of the opportunities uh, in the future that we could jointly think about and, and, and present. Um, so let us not miss those opportunities uh, and uh, make sure that, uh, you know, a new uh, thinking, uh, new visions, new approaches will also be um, collected, especially from, from a younger generation as well. well. Thank you. We'll probably return to both the younger generation and the Secretary General's common agenda uh, later, but I know that there are a number of uh, uh, eager participants to ask questions. I saw uh, Laura, uh, you, and please unmute your microphones and introduce yourself. Thank you, Laura Rockwood, Open Nuclear Network. It's a pleasure to have you here again, Itsumi. Um, speaking about a very concrete uh, conflict dealing in the context of disarmament, have you seen any renewed activity or initiatives either on behalf of the North Koreans or from the UN vis-a-vis -vis the North Koreans, um, since there's been uh, very little interaction over the last couple of years. And perhaps if you have any insight uh, on the COVID situation in North Korea and the COVAX initiative. Thank you. Should we take several questions or you yeah, would like cool. to, to, to test it? I know that there was a uh, question somewhere over there. I saw a hand, but I don't see it now. Uh, OK. Ambassador Ikehara, right? If I can recognize and then I'll come to you. Um, Ambassador oh, yeah, I, I think I, I, I came a bit late, but uh, uh, thank you for giving me the floor. Um, I really would like to extend uh, our, our most heart Welcome to High Representative Nakamis. It's so nice to see you in Vienna in person once again. And thank you, Irina, for organizing this uh, very interesting occasion. I have uh, two comments and one question. Yeah, and I try always try to be, be positive when the things, even when things are getting uh, a bit complicated. The uh, one of the uh, ways to look things in a positive way is that the, this situation after the invasion uh, to Ukraine, uh, uh, make it clear that uh, what we already have, as High Representative Nakamis already mentioned, uh, we, confirm, we confirm the value of what we already have uh, in the uh, uh, nuclear disarmament non proliferation uh, scheme, i.e., NPT scheme, and uh, what we uh, sometimes consider as a low hanging fruit is actually is not at all low hanging, but it's something to 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 be taken care of well and uh, uh, pursue they are of great value. I'm thinking about something like a, a risk reduction or transparency, all these issues. Uh, I'm not I'm not claiming that we should stop there, but at least we have to recognize the value that of what we have already we have within our hand. And the second uh, the, at least uh, the, in comparison with the, uh, the difficult uh, last uh, conference six years ago, one positive element is the advancement of nuclear technology uh, related. And I, I think it relates to all the three pillars, but especially uh, for the uh, pillar three, the peaceful uses of nuclear energy and uh, perhaps the strengthening uh, in, in, I mean, the, in relation to the uh, pillar two, the strengthening of 3S, the uh, safeguards, sec safety, security uh, for all of them. And I, I imagine also for Pillar 1, the advancement of nuclear technology is a very important positive element. And my question is about 
the, uh, related to what uh, High Representative Nakagen mentioned in her opening uh, uh, remarks, the, if the, uh, uh, as we always already uh, we have been talking, that the situation in Ukraine is uh, really something which would impact the uh, international security structure, and at the same time, the the this nuclear disarmament uh, non proliferation is not a, a European gadget, but it's tool for the international security regime. Uh, we, we have to be very, uh, uh, we have to be clear about what kind of impact, uh, what kind of uh, spotlight uh, uh, shed uh, on the, the, the nuclear uh, disarmament or non proliferation regime uh, to its structure by the invasion to Ukraine. Uh, what uh, perhaps including their strengths and the weakness. Uh, we have to be very clear about that. Uh, uh, if we try to, to capture the impact of the of this situation on uh, on the real on the, uh, nuclear disarmament regime as a real tool for the international security system. So I would like to have a, a little bit more detailed uh, insight uh, from High Representative Nakamits on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. Why don't we take these two questions, maybe, and then okay. collect more? Um, Laura, in DPRK, um, is there a new initiative? Um, I am not really aware of. Um, because of those uh, missile launches, um, we continue to, the UN Secretariat continue to brief the Security Council. Um, the Council uh, continued to um, consider the matter um, and um, for us it's it's the, the series of council resolutions that guide our work uh, this said uh, in the public you know open uh, reporting domain they, they are uh, quite serious concerning uh, uh, reports uh, potential sort of predictions of um, um, further actions by the DPRK so we are uh, you know closely monitoring um, and uh, our comment is definitely that, you know, these, uh, the situations um, really highlight the need for, um, you know, more sort of a comprehensive uh, thinking towards uh, how to um, achieve uh, denuclearization uh, on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we thought the COVID, I mean, first of all, we don't know the COVID situation. We don't know the humanitarian situation uh, within DPRK. Um, but, um, um, you know, there will have to be uh, really um, uh, further actions on the part of the international community. And a success, I think, will depend on whether the Security Council will be able to maintain or restore, I should say, a, a strong unity uh, amongst them. Um, and, um, and, you know, we continue to um, impress upon the Security Council members uh, to that effect. Um, the question and the positive um, and, you know, uh, comment from, from the ambassador, uh, Japanese ambassador, I, I also wanted to say that one positive, I not, I'm not sure if, it, if I can actually say straightforward uh, a positive impact. Um, I think the world community really realized how acute the nuclear danger is. Um, you know, we, we say from the UN that, um, you know, it's, it's not an abstract, it is actually a really real threat. Um, as I said, I'm not sure if it is a positive thing, but uh, there is, a, at a minimum, there is more public awareness uh, that we need to tackle those issues. Um, and um, and, and I, I hope that this will then be turned into a positive force um, and, um, and, you know, they will be, um, uh, if you will, a common understanding that nuclear weapons actually are a common problems that uh, the international community really has to uh, face. Um, at the end of the World War II, there was that recognition, definitely, and that's why the first GA, UN uh, General Assembly resolution, um, you know, included, uh, you know, issues related to nuclear weapons, atomic weapons. Uh, we need to now make sure that this common understanding that nuclear weapons are a common problem for, for, for us 
um, we need to make sure that Ukrainian war uh, will be uh, that occasion. Um, I also say that if we can protect, and I certainly hope that we will be able to, uh, if we can protect the non-use principle, uh, then we can we might be able to, or we can uh, probably reinforce the perception that nuclear weapons really a weapon, category of weapon that really cannot be used. Uh, after going through all these different wars uh, in the history of the United Nations, uh, it was never used. Uh, so let, that's why we say that non-use principle absolutely must be uh, protected. Um, it, it is with the hope that we reinforce that perception of non, you know, not usable uh, um, weapons. Um, let's um, make sure that um, that will be the case, and um, and that also goes to the impact of. I mean, what are the real impact of um, you know your question part uh, Ukrainian war um, on on these matters? Um, I think you know looking at. Um, Again, uh, the, the media reports, a number of countries are immediately uh, increasing military spending. Uh, so at least in the immediate phase, we might be in a situation where they will be um, more reliance on military based security. Um, there will be more deterrence, nuclear deterrence based security. Um, there will be definitely public opinion who will be uh, looking at uh, those uh, means of um, national security. This said, I want to go back to this false narrative that we are very concerned about that are sort of circulating amongst the public, in particular media circles, uh, that um, Ukraine was a nuclear weapon state. Um, this is, I mean, this community knows that it is not an accurate um, narrative, uh, but we have to make sure that those inaccurate um, narratives will be countered uh, because that will create uh, not just a negative impact on disarmament part, but it will also create a, a stronger or increased driver for proliferation as well. And that is not in the interest of anyone. Um, so we, we have to make sure that, um, as I said, uh, public messaging from, you know, professionals, disarmament professionals, the security professionals will be quite important uh, to make sure that there will be always uh, accurate uh, understanding of the, the historical uh, facts. Thank you, Zumi. Uh, I suggest we I'll ask, I'll take two more questions, then we'll take something if we have questions from the uh, those who are online. And then I know that a couple of other uh, individuals who wanted to pose a question. We'll start with Ambassador uh, Duarte, and I think somebody on, in the back over there. Please. Thank you very much, Elena. <clears throat> My name is Carlos Duarte. I'm permanent representative of Brazil here to the um, International Atomic Energy Agency and to the CTPTO in Vienna. Thank you very much for the first VCDNP for this opportunity. It's really um, a pleasure to hear the high representative um, speak to us uh, on in the run up of, as she put it, milestone events that are coming up in the next in the next few months. In particular, of course, the the uh, review conference uh, of the NPT. Um, I mean, it will be a kind of a belated 50th uh, anniversary for the NPT. Very important. Uh, there are those, let's say, better known challenges in terms of disarmament and non-proliferation, peaceful uses as well. Um, maybe certain frustrations in particular with regard to nuclear disarmament uh, and of course have motivated in case the, the DPNW and, and other initiatives. Um, uh, maybe also, after 25 years, the non-entry into force of the CTBT has also contributed to that. So this context, let's say, we 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 know well. But the um, really critical element here, which we don't know how uh, how it will actually impact in I mean, two two months from now, is uh, of course the situation, the the the, the crisis in Ukraine, and there. Um, Thinking ahead, as as she put, which I think is a very positive and and 
uh, fruitful way of, of, of dealing with these issues. What can we, how can we think ahead? But um, dealing with the Ukrainian situation, it sort of poses a complex, uh, let's say, challenge. Because with regard to nuclear weapons, on the one hand, of course, uh, it has, uh, let's see, it has sort of made resurface this idea of the use of nuclear weapons and made it, let's say, more, more present, uh, more, more actual. And in a sense, it has, of course, highlighted the, the dangers of, of, of nuclear weapons. Uh, but on the other, it, it also seems to have reinforced the case, at least for certain countries, um, with regard to the protection that the a nuclear umbrella gives them. So how to deal with this dilemma? And I see here that the VCDNP has, um, as part of its uh, inscriptions there, dialogue, research, and education. So how to educate? Uh, where, again, uh, a high representative mentioned, uh, for example, no first use or non-use of nuclear weapons, but how can we reinforce that message in a context where, in a certain way, nuclear weapons are also being used to justify a, 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 a sort of protection in in the in the current days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. We'll take one more question uh, before returning to um, my representative. Please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, my name is Pui from the, the CTBTO. Uh, as you mentioned that um, it's very important, particularly in the current context, to talk about disarmament and non-proliferation. My question is, how can we do this in an inclusive manner, uh, making sure that this discussion includes least developing or developing countries? And what is your view on uh, better integrating and attracting talents from these countries in, in, field, in the field of uh, disarmament? And uh, what are the current UNODA's effort uh, in this regard? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, start with this too. Thank you, Ambassador Duarte. Unfortunately, there is no single silver bullet, as you know, to, to your really important question. I mean, in fact, that's at the very center of how we can make progress in nuclear disarmament and, and you know, bring us all to the elimination point. Um, as I said, I think number one, protect the non-use, um, but also formulate, try to formulate a common understanding that nuclear weapons are a common problem. It is absolutely true that some countries continue to rely on nuclear deterrence in their security policies and strategies. And, and you know, immediate impact of Ukraine was that more countries will probably, at least in the short run, will, you know, increase that reliance. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to make sure that countries actually understand that you cannot stop there. If they stop there, then we will always, they will always risk reaching immediately to a catastrophic events. Um, you know, we have been, not just myself, but the Secretary General, uh, he himself, uh, has been talking about the risk of nuclear weapons actually being used by, hopefully not intentionally, but miscalculation by mistakes, etc., is, uh, you know, very high. So we have to formulate a common understanding that it is a common problem, the challenge that the international community collectively um, has, and we have to, you know, tackle these uh, questions. Um, and I think one really important approach in, in, you know, making sure that we will start tackling this is this uh, humanitarian approach. Um, really understanding um, what the consequence of a nuclear weapon use, I think, is something that really appeals to public. Um, you know, really easy to understand what the, the, the nature of the risk is. Uh, and then use that as a very important motivation for first and first and foremost 
start really tackling the risk reduction measures, but risk reduction is not a substitute to disarmament. It has to be framed as a first step towards disarmament, first step towards the elimination path, um, and um, you know, start you know decreasing the reliance uh, in their de deterrence is not just nuclear. Um, you know, start reducing the the reliance on nuclear weapons in their deterrence uh, uh, policies and, and doctrines. Um, and then, um, you know, formulate uh, how we will be able to collectively move towards um, the disarmament and, and elimination path. I think there will be many things that we need to do, and, and many of the new things that we need to do is precisely to look at those uh, new issues like the new domains and, and new technologies. Um, you know, traditionally, nuclear disarmament always counted the number of arsenals um, and then, you know, try to, to reduce, but it's no longer, I mean, that is not sufficient um, in, in modern world. So there are new, uh, very complicated additional challenges put on us. So hopefully um, our efforts going forward beyond the MPT uh, review conference uh, will be able to discuss some of those. And then, you know, we have um, one opportunity uh, as a follow-up to the Secretary General's common agenda, um, there will be a new agenda for peace, uh, which uh, will need to address some of those, um, you know, create a really good multilateral uh, processes so that we could collectively also um, tackle some of those really, unfortunately, really complicated uh, challenges. Um, inclusivity. Um, well, I think there is um, um, increased awareness that um, those nuclear disarmament negotiations uh, really need to be uh, inclusive. And uh, one of the reasons, of course, it's the right thing to do, but it's, it's a smart thing to do. Um, if we involve uh, those younger generation, if we involve the, the civil society, the expert community, if we involve uh, women, um, we actually benefit uh, from, you know, the perspectives that are not perhaps traditionally in the negotiation room, um, but we, we actually benefit, uh, you know, from those new and, and more innovative, creative approaches. So I think we are, you know, definitely at a stage where we understand the usefulness of, um, you know, making those uh, platforms, the, the multilateral processes more inclusive. Uh, the question is how to do it. I mean, at the MPT, forthcoming MPT, um, I hope that they will be a youth uh, um, platforms. They will be also a gender um, um, uh, platforms. Uh, I, I, I know and I have been really uh, benefiting from expert community. Um, many of those uh, people who are represented here today. Um, and, and so we need to make sure that those perspectives will then be fed into the actual uh, process of uh, negotiation. Um, you know, Vienna, I think, also is a, in a way a, a very unique. I mean, it, you know, you have been um, really um, um, a center of, um, you know, um, not just, not just non-proliferation, but uh, as the Japanese ambassador also mentioned, um, you know, the peaceful uses um, and um, some of the, the you know, verification um, related discussions, the, the technical questions also are taking place in, in, in Vienna. Um, so we have to make sure that all these will be then fed into, substantively fed into um, the discussions that we will have uh, in the summer and beyond. Thank you, Zuma. And since you mentioned uh, the peaceful uses of uh, nuclear energy and science and technology, and that is also one of the big issues here in Vienna, particularly for the International Atomic Energy Agency. And where, where I want to link it is to something that you've already uh, mentioned uh, and relates to the impact of the current uh, war in Ukraine. Um, not only on the disarmament per se, but also on the overall um, situation, including in the development world, in the food security. I think that uh, we already heard some devastating predictions about the drop in the 
uh, grain production, uh, supply of other important commodities. And that, that to me is also one of the uh, evidences of the horrific impact of both the um, arms conflicts and further um, arms race, both be it conventional and not even speaking about now uh, nuclear weapons and others. But um, this is one of the big pillars of the work here in Vienna, yep. obviously, in addition to non-proliferation issues and disarmament. But um, maybe uh, that is one of the linkages that would also be extremely important to reflect in the some of the new strategies developing and developed at the UN by Secretary General. I hope that there is a reflection of that as well. It's just a comment, sorry. Yes. Cannot resist <laughs> to promote the work of the, but I would like to ask my colleague Noah Mayhew for um, if there are questions from our online audience. We didn't forget about you. So if there are any, please, um, uh, Noah, let us know. Thank you very much, Helena, and uh, thanks for your remarks, High Representative. Um, there are quite a few comments coming in, but uh, I have had to narrow them down to just two. Uh, the first question is from uh, Ambassador Rafulane Molikanek, to whom I apologize if I have not pronounced your name correctly. He asks a question about nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, the, the question is if you could comment on the Pelandaba Treaty and if it uh, has the effectiveness of the Pelandama Treaty in the light of nuclear weapon states modernizing and upgrading uh, their, their nuclear weapons programs. And he tacks on to that um, the question, can the so-called deterrent argument be sustained? So that's the first question. The second question is uh, something you've already touched upon, but um, I, I thought that uh, you could tease this out a bit more. This is from Vladimir Sotnikov, uh, who's a senior research fellow at the Institute of Oriental Studies at the Russian Academy of Sciences. He asks, how do you envision, uh, envisage further engagement of Russia in non-proliferation efforts in light of the Russia-Ukraine crisis? Thank you, Noah. Ambassador Molikan is uh, ambassador from South Africa. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you. Um, but uh, just uh, your comment about the food security. I mean, one of the reasons why this war is quite different from many of the previous wars is precisely that the impact is at the global, not just on security, uh, but uh, food security, energy, you know, financial uh, aspect, economic and, and, and financial aspects. I mean, the, the, the impact will be quite global and, and we are beginning to see that, especially the food security. And the Secretary General just did a stakeout uh, after he met uh, the Austrian president and then he really uh, talked about that as well. Um, I think between Russia and Ukraine, um, uh, one third of uh, um, wheat uh, exports uh, is from those two countries. And many of the global south rely on on those wheat and and not just the production but the fact that it does it, it cannot leave um, you know it was usually transported out of uh, black sea from from odessa uh, and because of the war um, that cannot be done etc so so we are the un is fully aware of this and we are actively working on those issues um, so on the many of the other fronts that actually has the um, um, a global impact, um, you know, the UN is trying to tackle uh, very actively how to how to mitigate at a minimum uh, the impact and the negative impact. Um, nuclear weapon free zones. Um, we have been in in the past couple of years. We have uh, refocused on on the the use, utility usefulness of these uh, nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, in fact. Um, it, it has been one of the more sort of uh, successful uh, stories uh, when it comes to, you know, really contributing to a nuclear uh, elimination and disarmament path. Um, and it will be quite important that um, these uh, different nuclear weapon free zones um, share their information, their experience and, and lessons uh, between them um, so that um, those uh, free zones can also um, contribute, um, you know, uh, and spread their contributions to other regions. I'm also uh, looking at, uh, you know, uh, the Middle East uh, uh, zone free of uh, nuclear and other uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we have uh, organized uh, um, um, 
workshops uh, to um, to collect lessons from all the other um, uh, nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, Kazakhstan was a, was a supporter of, of of that particular work that we have been doing. So I think we we really need to to refocus on how uh, we will be able to further strengthen and of course the the issues of uh, protocols uh, are always there. Um, um, the question from from Russia. Um, what I can say is that uh, we are, I am personally also uh, maintaining uh, a quite substantive engagement with the Russian Federation. Uh, I just had a meeting um, on Friday uh, with the Russian ambassador uh, in New York uh, related to nuclear uh, and, and a couple of other issues, but um, we spent quite a, a lot of time on, on nuclear weapons uh, issues. Um, I hope that, um, you know, and I know also that uh, Russian Federation is also <clears throat> actively involved in, um, for example, outer space uh, open edit working group this week. Um, so the engagement is definitely there. Um, and I hope that, um, you know, when we have August uh, NPT, uh, we will be able to, um, you know, come up with, um, you know, uh, common ground. Um, they have been, for example, um, the P5 joint statement that they issued, I think, on the, the 3rd of January. Um, that's obviously before uh, the Ukrainian war started, uh, but it provides at least the common grounds um, amongst the P5. So uh, we are really appealing to the sense of responsibilities of nuclear weapon states uh, to come together and then, um, um, you know, um, protect uh, the, the the priority issues that I mentioned already. Um, and um, the ball is definitely uh, in the court of um, those nuclear weapon states um, as to how they will find a way to do it as well. Thank you, <clears throat> Ambassador. Um, uh, I do have already a list. I know that your hand over there, um, uh, you'll be afterwards um i would maybe follow up on that question uh about the upcoming npt review conference um given that we all of course concerned about the uh integrity and continuing kind of preserving what we have what in your view uh, would be a successful outcome of that tense review conference. How do you see it? Like, what are the the possibilities? Of course, there's it's a big concern how the current events and uh, overall situation is affecting um, the the both the atmospherics, the different positions, the deepening of some of these positions and divides. Uh, what do you see in, in in your view would be a successful outcome of the tense review conference? Yeah, reaffirming the non-use principle, uh, reaffirming uh, also um, the norms against uh, testing. Uh, I think that has been repeatedly done. Uh, that should be uh, done again. Of course, the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Um, and um, I think what's something really important is that uh, reaffirming their commitment again uh, to a world free of nuclear weapons um, and um, and those are of course declarations um, and um, and and um, we then need to figure out how to to get there but i think um, those are a high level and very strong reaffirmation of those norms uh, will be quite important um, i think it's also um, very important uh, that um, there will be uh, reaffirmation of uh, obligations that they have made uh, under the treaty. Um, and, um, you know, uh, there will be probably a few different ways of doing it um, and, and exactly how they, they might be able to do it. We will have to see in the in the negotiations. But I, in our view, uh, it will be quite important uh, from the United Nations uh, point of view. Um, I think as I mentioned, um, you know, the January uh, joint statement by non nuclear um, um, nuclear weapon states 
or you know, if they could somehow uh, reaffirm uh, that um, e even you know after the 24th of February they are still committed to that joint uh, statement, I think will be uh, important positive input into maintaining uh, uh, atmospherics uh, as well. Um, and of course, um, you know, risk reduction I mentioned um, and, um, and facilitate, um, you know, uh, wider access to uh, nuclear science and technology. You talked about, uh, you know, a lot of uh, vibrant active discussions taking place in, in Vienna. Um, we think that those things should be better linked to SDGs implementations, for example, um, you know, disarmament, non-proliferation and, uh, uh, you know, sustainable development. They don't actually exist in silos. They should come together a little bit closer. Uh, if they could actually find a way to, to reflect that, I think it would be good. Now, as to the, the format of how to sort of capture some of those, um, I think it's a good news that uh, MPT does not have a template, if you will. You know, it doesn't. It, it will have to be in a comprehensive outcome document. It's it's been very flexible. Mm -hmm. um, some of the successful uh, um, conferences, you know, at the um, uh, indefinite extension in '95 or 2010, they were different formats uh, being used. Um, so I, I think that this flexibility. Um, in terms of a, a format um, the MPT review conferences can have is also a, a positive thing. Um, if uh, states parties can be creative uh, and if they have a, a sort of joint political will to make sure that a review conference will have a reasonable success, uh, I think uh, there will be a way um, that can be found to capture some of those elements that I've um, summarized. Thank you. That's a very good, <laughs> very valid point, and I'm sure um, something that we desperately need uh, and nowadays. Uh, I'll take two more questions, no, three questions from the audience here, and if there are additional from online, then, then I'll return back. Uh, Ambassador Solana, uh, I believe, then I see a placard over there. I think it's Russian Federation, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, somebody over there, like these three, in that order. Uh, and then Thailand afterwards. OK, um, please. Thank you, Elena, and thank you for organizing this event with the UNODA office. I'm very pleased to see Mrs. Nakamitsu here in Vienna. Yeah, I, I will be very brief. You said that during the, the crisis period, and there are also the opportunity to take uh, or identify opportunities. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you have here in your your office in Vienna is specialized in focus in training, and this issue is very important for us. So uh, I was wondering, or your views about uh, how to foster this, this role of the uh, cultural piece of the training in terms of um, peaceful training, not only for those actually engaged in the process, but probably broader uh, action between thinking about uh, the future generations and how to spread this process because it's, it's very important to, to promote this kind of awareness and it's also special in terms of uh, consider that the important role that UN can play in for the future generations. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll take three questions in a row and then we will uh, come back. Um, I think Roman, no? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Roman Ustinov. I'm from the Russian Federation. Uh, thank you very much, VCDNP, for organizing this meeting and the High Representative for your assessments and for highlighting uh, the value of the uh, Vienna venue in terms of non-proliferation to a certain extent uh, arms control so that we don't get bored here uh, from time to time. Uh, I uh, just wanted, uh, well, listening to a discussion, I just wanted to make uh, a, sm a small comment, uh, which I uh, did not turn into question, but uh, still. Um, 
there is there seem to be a tendency from what has been said here to uh, put everything, all the burden of uh, what is happening right now in the non-proliferation and arms control sphere uh, into the situation uh, around uh, Ukraine and into the uh, situation that emerged uh, only two months uh, ago. And turning a blind eye to what has been happening for the last uh, 20 years in the non-proliferation and ar arms control. Uh, where uh, important uh, arrangements, treaties uh, and agreements with the Russian Federation, uh, extremely important in arms control sphere, were tiered by the United States, where uh, uh, the uh, JCPOA, an extremely important uh, uh, arrangement in the uh, sphere of non-proliferation -prolifer was uh, unprovokedly left by the United States without any uh, reasons, uh, and it is extremely difficult to restore it right now, as everybody uh, see the uh, absolute uh, intransigence of Washington in terms of WMD free zone in the Middle East and aspire that uh, the majority of the countries in the region have and could not realize. Uh, recent among the recent developments is AUKUS creating uh, extreme challenges in the uh, Asian uh, re region. And I will not go uh, down into history, uh, sparing uh, your time uh, in terms of the WMD false pretexts uh, to uh, invade uh, Iraq. All of that has been uh, accumulating for lots of years, and there seems to be uh, no attention to it. Uh, it. There has no been attention, and there is no attention right now. And uh, I think that the very simplistic and to a certain extent primitive uh, approach to account for all the uh, negative tendencies, fundamental negative tendencies in the non-proliferation regime to the situation uh, in Ukraine is detrimental to non-proliferation, uh, is detrimental to arms control and to the international uh, security. So uh, I would like to repeat that as we spoke uh, here in Vienna with Ambassador Zlauvenen, president of the forthcoming uh, conference, uh, we are intended to be uh, uh, constructive uh, and uh, uh, business-like during the upcoming non-proliferation review conference uh, and we hope for a balanced uh, and uh, business-like approach to all three pil pillars uh, of the NPT and to the non-proliferation for the sake of non-proliferation and for the sake of international security. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. It's good to hear that there is a, a constructive uh, approach. Uh, and there is one more question before I turn the microphone to you, and then we have three other people. So please, please, brief, uh, please be brief in um, asking your questions. Thank you. I I will try. I am Dominika Kreuz. Uh, I'm the permanent representative of Poland here. Um, thank you very much for for this meeting and and thank you for for taking this uh, opportunity to meet uh, with us while you are in vienna you mentioned uh, recommitment to the npt as a goal uh, on one hand a very modest goal goal but uh, but on the other hand extremely ambitious uh, bearing in mind the, the situation which we are facing now you mentioned trust is a very difficult feeling uh, in Europe. It's particularly difficult at the moment. Um, you mentioned the need to uh, have a successful conference. Um, what kind of, if you look at the past and, and, and your experience and your assessment, what kind of achievements uh, in the life of, of the NPT would you see 
um, to make it a compelling argument for for the NPT being still a valid uh, treaty for for international uh, community. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we? OK, like two question, one comment. OK, <laughs> all right. Um, thank you for the question on training um, opportunities. Uh, it is one of our priorities. I, I very much agree with you that um, not just the, the, you know, diplomats, those who are already practitioners, um, you know, broader audience uh, of uh, creating a future generation who will then become uh, professionals in this field. I think it's really absolutely critical. Um, in, in many senses, you know, during the Cold War uh, period, there were many people who were really interested in those arms control disarmament areas. Uh, I think um, we need to recultivate this interest um, and um, uh, involve uh, wider groups of people, especially younger people, especially, um, you know, uh, women, um, and uh, a global south uh, who would also be able to become a really, um, you know, agent uh, for for change. And then those, uh, you know, younger generation uh, also bringing new perspectives and how to actually tackle some of the technological uh, aspect, I think will be quite important. So we are actually reviewing um, our training uh, um, work. Um, we will be, um, you know, uh, creating a, a sort of better strategies uh, for it. They, you know, they have been a number of uh, new materials. We, we are utilizing more online platforms, uh, making available these learning modules in, in different uh, areas. Uh, but at this said, I think it's also important to, to have uh, in-person exchanges so that that will be, uh, you know, uh, exchange of different perspectives coming from different parts of the world, etc. Uh, so um, we are um, working on this, uh, uh, if you will, a new strategy for training and learning and empowerment, I would say, uh, and youth involvement opportunities, definitely prioritizing uh, that area. And I think uh, Vienna will be uh, one of the, the critical centers for those activities. Um, I want to also respond to the Russian Federation comment. You know, I, I agree with you, and that's why I said many of the stresses actually existed before uh, Ukraine. Uh, many of the, the, the you know, um, issues and challenges uh, really existed um, before the war started. Um, and, and that's exactly what I said today, and that's what I have been saying. Um, and, you know, I, I make... Um, sort of uh, speeches in, in different platforms. And, and I usually say that those, um, you know, arms race dynamics is both a, a symptom and cause um, of, um, you know, tensions. It's, it's feeding into further tensions and we have to reverse that. Um, and that is absolutely uh, our message as well. Uh, but this said, um, that doesn't actually mean that um, you can settle those grievances by invading, invading a neighboring country. Uh, there is a, a diplomatic means uh, that we need to utilize specific settlement of disputes. Um, that's why multilateral diplomacy, bilateral diplomacies exist. And, and we are calling for uh, more investment in, in, in diplomacy precisely because uh, the world is, is, is such a, a difficult and dangerous uh, place uh, today. I mean, the Secretary General said in today's stakeout, again, um, this war in Ukraine is senseless. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so that, that will be uh, definitely uh, the position that we have been repeating. Um, a question from um, uh, Ambassador from Poland. MPT is still important. If there is no MPT, um, there could be um, 20, 30 more nuclear weapon states. Um, if, um, if we actually get rid of the MPT, um, would the world be a safer place? My answer is clearly no. Um, we feel that the world will be definitely much more dangerous place. And that's why we say that we have to formulate a common understanding that nuclear weapons are not the ultimate guarantee of security. Um, it is rather a, a common challenge that we need to tackle. Um, you know, when we are, I mean, the time that we will be 
um, free from um, a nuclear, the re real nuclear danger will be the time that nuclear weapons are eliminated. Um, and, um, and, and NPT definitely is a, a cornerstone of that uh, uh, regime. And, and we have to absolutely um, protect uh, this regime. Um, you know, whether there is a, a a uh, global uh, norm regime existing or not will make a, a, a big difference when there is a time uh, for all of you to start rebuilding international uh, and especially it has to start from from um, from Europe. Um, there is a, a new new uh, security architecture. Uh, there will have to be a disarmament and arms control um, tools uh, integrated. And it has been serving, those instruments have been serving for security uh, for many years. Uh, and it will have to uh, come back to that stage. Um, and that's why NPT will still remain important. And, and let's not, you know, um, get rid of that. Then the world will become a much more dangerous place. Thank you. I think we're approaching the time, but we'll probably take one more question. Uh, um, Ambassador Srisvasti, and I apologize if we won't get to other questions in advance. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, VCDNP and UNODA for organizing this uh, event. Very useful, very informative, and thank you very much for your presence here, Madam Nakasmitsu. Um, I, I have two points. First, about the NPT outcome um, that you said that, um, uh, yes, reaffirming norms against testing, no, no use principle, and commitments are the commitments. Yes, and I wish uh, to uh, also mention about the peaceful uses the third pillar, which is also the integral part of the NPT from the very beginning. And with this, um, VCDNP task force has worked on um, the, the, uh, the recommendation on the peaceful uses. And I think this is a, um, a very good um, uh, uh, recommendations that uh, state parties of the NPT could make use uh, of this report and um, uh, use it for for the um, as part of the, the the negotiation for the outcome documents and and I I, I, I know that um, this is the work of the agency here but um, I wish to take this opportunity to uh, kindly uh, kind kind of uh, promote this uh, report for the VCDNP who is uh, one of the organizer of this meeting. Um, thank you for that. And um, second, uh, when you're talking about the um, uh, the the risk reduction, you said that the risk uh, reduction um, it's not uh, to uh, the the substitute for disarmament. I I totally agree with this uh, views, and and I I totally agree that when you said that uh, we cannot just reduce uh, rely on the uh, deterrence and and that's it. And I think um, with this the obligations of the NPT need to be reaffirmed. All obligations by the state parties uh, to implement the NPT in full. So um, as not only the NPT will conference in August, we also have the TPW, the first meeting of the state parties. And this is the opportunity for dialogue, for uh, having uh, state parties um, all state parties of TPW is a state party to NPT. That is very important. And um, I think um, to go beyond the efforts beyond the NPT, this is the opportunity for state parties to have dialogue, to engage and to discuss ways and means that how could we deal with this, uh, uh, the nuclear issues, the nuclear um, uh, weapons, and, and, and lead us towards the objective of both NPT and TPNW, that is the world will be secured uh, by, by us all. And this is our commitment, this is our responsibilities. So I, I just uh, wish to, to thank you for, for uh, raising this uh, views and, and I share your views and comments on this uh, very, important issues. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Ambassador Suswasti. No, thank you very much. I, I agree with you on, on all fronts. Um, on the peaceful uses, uh, it's a really important aspect of, of the MPT. Uh, and we always said that, you know, there will have to be a balanced outcome on the three or three pillars. Uh, that includes, obviously, the, the peaceful uses. And as I said, it will be really good if we can, you know, make a closer link to SDG implementations, etc. Uh, in, in that pillar particularly. Um, and um, obligations made, yes, absolutely. And on TPNW, since, uh, you know, I, I speak uh, under the authority of the president designate, of course, uh, but uh, I, I agree with the approach that the states, pay, states parties of a TPNW in their preparations for the first, uh, um, uh, com, you know, meeting of uh, states parties. Um, there have been very active discussions taking place um, and um, the focus on humanitarian, uh, you know, consequences, uh, quite important, as I already mentioned, uh, complementarity um, of, you know, between TPNW and, and MPT. You are absolutely right. You know, TPNW states parties are also MPT states parties and, and as such, um, they they both, you know, they want success in both uh, treaty uh, mechanisms, the regimes. Um, and I think it's really good that they are really focused on how to ensure complementarity. Uh, and then the third, um, you know, positive obligations. This is something uh, quite new um, in nuclear disarmament field and, and the focus um, on Kazakhstan, of course, uh, taking a lead in that discussions. Um, you know, focus on those aspects that actually you know, create new contributions to uh, nuclear disarmament is also quite important. So I am uh, very much looking forward to uh, coming back in, in June and, and, you know, listen to the state's parties discussions uh, on, on many of those fronts. Thank you, Zuma, very much. I also wanted to note that we will host, the VCDNP will host an online event on May 20th uh, from 11 to noon and information is on our website specifically on the upcoming uh, first meeting of state parties of the TPNW with Ambassador Kment and we'll also with representative from the ICRC and ICANN about the humanitarian uh, conference and other events around these two big um, uh, events in Vienna, meetings in Vienna. Um, I think we probably need to close down and I know you have a, a meeting following, but and I apologize for those uh, who I was not able to ask questions and give the floor. But um, before we say thank you and um, close the meeting, I wanted to touch upon something that you already mentioned and several questions were brought about the engagement of youth of um, uh, of the next generation of women, uh, diversity. And I wanted to highlight that we also have here somebody in the audience who got a, a ch challenge prize from the UN uh, for the participation. And she's also one of the mentees in our programs. Say hi, Virginia. <laughs> so it's, it's fantastic that we, even on that level, we could cooperate um, and engage the, the next generation. But uh, with that, I want to thank all of you for, for joining us today and those who were uh, joining us from uh, virtually uh, on Zoom or Teams uh, uh, on different platforms. But most and foremost, and um, I representative Nakamitsu, it's such a pleasure always to have you. I know you have a very busy agenda with all the meetings and other events. So it's we really appreciate and um, uh, the time you've spent today and the willingness to, to speak and candidly provide your views on many of the important issues on nuclear non-proliferation disarmament uh, and arms control and specifically on some of the issues that are of big interest here in Vienna. We wish you success in all your um, next trips uh, here and other big meetings that are coming this year and we'll look forward to seeing you again in Vienna. Also big thank you to the UNODA office. Uh, I'm looking forward for further cooperation with you. Please join me thanking um, Azuna. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you. Oops. <laughs>